Hello, my name is Ivan. I am Applications Engineer with ST Microelectronics. And today I want to talk about stability of offline bug converters with Viper Plus switchers. And I want to give you practical guidelines on how to verify your prototype, make sure there's nothing wrong with the switching activity, that it can work in the full input voltage range, and that it can deliver the full output power that's designed to do. I will start with some basics and just a little bit of theory. I'm certainly not going into the details of the theory behind feedback analysis. Then I'm going to show you how to design a simple schematic. It's very quick and an easy way using our design suite. And then I'm going to go in the lab and give you some examples of a bug converter that has poor face margin. It's not very stable in the way that it affects the switching activity. And I will correct that, fix the compensation, and show you what good switching activity looks like. So this is a typical schematic of a bug converter that uses Viper Plus. It's fairly simple. Uh, on the input we have the rectifier and the EMI filter. The Viper itself, or the MOSFET of the Viper, is the switching device. This diode is a freewheeling diode which ensures recirculation of the current during the off time. L2 is the energy storage device during the off time. And C9 is the output uh, filtering capacitor. As far as feedback, we sample the output voltage onto C8 via this high voltage diode which is then divided down by the resistive divider R4 and R3 that voltage is fed into the feedback input which is compared to the reference inside the error amplifier the output of the error amplifier is the comping or compensation where we connect the compensation network we will focus on this compensation network and uh, ensure with the right values for the components in it that the system is stable. That's what internally it looks like. Uh, again, the error amplifier is integrated. The feedback pin is one of the inputs of the error amplifier. The other input is uh, the reference voltage, which could be different depending on the type of Viper. It could be 1.2 volts or 3.3 volts. Uh, the comping is the output of the error amplifier where we would connect the compensation network. And that's just a simplified schematic of what it looks like. Uh, v in in this case is the output voltage that's sampled onto the capacitor, uh, divided down, uh, that's the error amplifier. And these components are external again. V out is uh, the output of the error amplifier or the comp in which we will uh, uh, always look at and make sure that the values of those components are right so that the system has sufficient face margin and it works correctly throughout the, uh, the full specification. Okay, so as I said before, I'm not going to go into the theory of feedback loop analysis and modeling. I'm just giving you an example, and this example is uh, shown in a number of application nodes that we have along with the demo boards. But that's what it is, it's just an example, and it only considers one type of switching mode, this continuous conduction mode. It is different for continuous conduction mode type of bug converter, so bear that in mind. Essentially what we're trying to achieve is calculate a number of parameters which will then we use for calculating the components uh, inside the compensator. So this is the the step-by-step -step procedure for designing the compensation network and in the end with all these parameters that we calculated above we will 
use them to calculate the values of all these resistors and capacitors as part of the feedback loop so that uh, we have a system that meets the specification that we set out um, to have. So that's just an example again. It will produce a closed loop system with crossover frequency of 2.1 kilohertz and phase margin of 72 degrees. 70 degrees is usually recommended. The theoretical minimum is for a well dampened system is 60 degrees. Uh, we recommend higher at least 70 degrees so that uh, component tolerance or uh, varying ambient uh, parameters like temperature will will not affect and push the system outside of the uh, stable zone and uh, make it unstable. But you don't have to go through this procedure, you can uh, pause it slide by slide and go through it, calculate values for your specific example. But you don't have to do that because we have a tool, a design suite that you can go ahead, design your system according to the specification that you have and uh, have the components ready calculated for you, for the compensator. So this is what I'm going to talk about next. Okay, that's how you get to the design. You can find it on the website, but it's very easy to just type it in eds.st.com. You have to create an account, so I'm just going to sign in. And then when you log in, you can access some projects that you worked on before. You have some examples. There are a number of things that you can uh, design with. Design suite. I'm gonna navigate into converter, AC to DC, non isolated. There's a few other uh, topology options isolated, non isolated. Buck converter is not isolated, obviously, so uh, click on buck converter and then you have all. 37 devices available right now that you can select from. Ideally, you would go ahead first and type in your specification. I will make this one as close as possible to the demo board that I will show you later. So it's a 5.6 volt output voltage. Current, I think it's 300 milliamp. Fairly low power. You will notice all devices are filtered out, devices that don't really meet the specification. So what's left is uh, those that you can choose from. And I will select Viper 115. And there's three options of this device. H for high frequency, 120 kilohertz. L for low frequency, 60 kilohertz. And X for uh, the lowest switching frequency available for this device. 30 kilohertz. You can look at the data sheet. Uh, there is some very brief uh, specification of the device itself. So I'll select this one. It will show you a preview of the design. Again, link to the data sheet and the product folder on the ST website. This is your specification. It's a wide range input, 85 to 65. And then you click on Start Design. This is what the result would look like. So the design is ready, essentially. That's the schematic with all critical values of components that are important for the design to work. Input rectifier. Um, in rush current limiter, fuse, those are not necessarily always specified because they are not so critical. It depends on the type of circuit that you're going to be designing this one in. Everything else that's blue color text, you can modify, like the input uh, pi filter capacitors. You can select different diodes. 
different capacitor, different inductor, and so on. So this is a compensation network, and you can see we have 1.2 nanofarad in parallel with 120 kilo ohm and uh, 47 nanofarad. This is the feedback resistive divider. Those can be modified. So what else do we have here? Uh, just very briefly, we have a full build material. We have a simulation. I wouldn't call it simulation because it's static. It will be affected by changing the values on some of the input parameters, for example, the input voltage. And you'll see the duty cycle will change from 1.5% to 6.5% and so on. Uh, different current will affect that result as well. You have uh, ambient temperature and so on. You have more information about the operating mode of the device here. You can see the device went from continuous conduction mode to discontinuous right now. You can expand this view and look into more details. If I increase the current to 300 milliamps, it will work in this in continuous conduction mode now. You can see the current does not reach zero. The red trace is the current. Okay, so the other things that we have, efficiency plots, again, those will be affected by the input parameters. Losses distribution, there is a pie chart, and depending on, on the input power, output power, you can see what is consuming most or where the losses actually go. IC switching most of the time is uh, fairly big chunk of the losses because uh, in this case it's working very high to voltage, the output diode as well. And the last thing is the body plot. Um, for this input output specification or operating point in this case, you will see that the crossover frequency is 613 hertz and the phase margin is 74 degrees, oops, sorry, if I lower the power to one third of what it was, you can see those things change, the crossover frequency obviously is now lower because the gain was lower, so you start off declining at two, roughly 20 dB a decade uh, at a lower uh, starting point, lower gain then declines from there. So the phase margin uh, will increase. You can see it's always about 70, 77, about 70 usually. So let's see what happens if we change the capacitor to slightly different capacitor. Let's select one with a very low ESR. This is 50 milliamps, that's very, very low ESR. Click on select. It's the same capacitance value, 7, 470 microfarad. Then you can auto complete. By the way, uh, these are the steps. So you can customize your design following step by step, but I'll just hit auto complete it will automatically modify the compensation network for me. And you can see the parallel capacitor went from 1.2 nanofarad to 560 picofarad right now. Uh, those values also slightly changed. So the two automatically calculated all these things for you. If you we're doing it manually using the equations that I showed before. That will take another iteration of recalculating everything only because you changed the output capacitor. Now, and you changed the ESR of the output capacitor, so you went from one part number to another part number, not really paying attention to this secondary parameter, which is the ESR of the capacitor. So that happens often. Uh, in real life, probably you wouldn't have changed 
the compensation uh, components and it won't necessarily break the bug converter but it may push it just a little bit so in some conditions it will be unstable and not behave very well and maybe you will lose regulation at some point which is the worst case that uh, that can happen so the output will basically not be regulated and go down to zero at one point, which essentially is a failure for the power supply. Also, you will see if I increase the capacitance, say I decided to use a millifarad because I want to have a 1.2 millifarad because I want to have very little ripple at the output. Are a complete different compensation network. You can see this value here now is much larger. So that's how the tool is actually helping you. Um, every time you choose to redesign the output filtering capacitor, change the inductor, modify the feedback divider, always double check that the Compensation network is similar, or if it changes, highly recommend you to, to go ahead and modify the compensation network as well. You can always test it in, in the lab on the bench and make sure one component was changed. I will show you how and what to look for, but if you change specifically output capacitors or change the load or reuse the same design for a different output voltage always make sure you test it on the bench or have a look at it uh, in the design and then double check on bench the last thing i'll show you today is i'll go in the lab and show you some scope plots that will highlight what uh, improper or poor switching activity looks like for when, when the bug is not stable. And then I will show you when I fix it, what the difference is between the switching activity and what is the uh, correct functionality of a bug converter and uh, how the switching activity is, is different than uh, when the phase margin was insufficient and it was working poorly. All right, so this is the demo board that I'm using today. It's a buck converter based on Viper 115X. This is a 30 kHz switching frequency device. The compensation network is right here. Uh, you have a capacitor, a resistor, and another capacitor. I hope you can see it probably not very well. Unfortunately, the demo board is quite beat up. That's my only one that I have for buck converter available at home. Um, and we have been working from home for the last couple of weeks because of the virus, unfortunately. But it's functional and it works well. Um, one more thing that I did is I lifted one of the pins of the inductor to connect this wire, which creates a current loop where I can hook a current probe and have a look at the current in the inductor. Also, I'm going to connect this voltage probe on the same net. This is the cathode of the output freewheeling diode. And I'm, I'm going to be looking at the voltage on it as well. I have another probe that's connected to the output wires, uh, which uh, I will be using for the output voltage. And that's about it. So let me uh, power it up and have a look at some waveforms. So I modified the compensation network of the board so that it exaggerates the uh, unstable behavior and you will see it in a second. I'm just gonna power up, ramp up the input voltage slowly and uh, you'll see it. Okay, so that's about 90 volts right now and you can see switching activity. The yellow trace is the voltage on the, the cathode of the freewheeling device. The blue one is the output voltage and the red trace is the current in the output inductor. You can see the voltage is about 6.23 volts and 
uh, the load's about 40 to 50 milliamps. That's the minimum I can set in this uh, electronic load right now, but it's fine. Um, so it's working, nothing really uh, stands out as far as output regulation. Uh, it should regulate at about uh, 5.6 volts. It's meant to have a downstream LDO or DC-DC converter, uh, but it's fine. So if I increase the voltage, you will notice the activity starts to change a little bit. Uh, let me pause it. You will see pulse to pulse there is a difference in the current peaks. That would essentially mean that the duty cycle is slightly different between those pulses. It's actually not slightly, it's a lot different. Um, you can, hopefully you can see it. This duty cycle is longer, this is shorter. Uh, and this one is a little longer again. So that's the first sign of instability. Uh, and I'm gonna start increasing the load and the behavior starts to be more obvious. There you go. So you can see these cycles, very high current peaks, lower switching frequency, low current peaks, higher switching frequency. I suspect the lower switching frequency is probably the device going into burst mode. This is about 30 kilohertz. The device is not skipping pulses. You can see this uh, irregular behavior. You wouldn't expect that if everything was normal. You want to see about 30 kilohertz, which is the switching frequency of the device, and no change in the peak current. And now you see this pattern, which is actually uh, it's not repetitive, it's kind of random as well. So the device goes into burst mode, out of burst mode. For this power level, it should always be uh, out of burst mode. And very likely in discontinuous mode. But you see this behavior, which which is a sign of instability. I'll certainly recommend every time you evaluate your solution to always check the waveforms and have a look if this behavior is, is happening. This is a sign of instability. And next thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and fix the compensation network. I will increase the capacitor that's parallel to the comp 10 and you will see the improvement in, in behavior. So I modified the compensation network of this board. I increased the parallel capacitor on the comp pin from a few couple picofarad to about four, I think it's a 470 picofarad. I know that's the right value. Uh, for stability because I've experimented before that. But you will see an obvious improvement in the switching activity. So let me ramp up the input voltage. There you go. Uh, that's about 85 volts at the input right now. Uh, we have 100 milliamp output current and immediately you will notice the peak current in the inductor, cycle to cycle, as the same level. That's a sign that uh, the duty cycle does not change cycle to cycle, and a sign of stable operation. If I increase the load, you will see that the duty cycle is increasing at one point above 220 milliamp output current, the converter will go into continuous conduction mode. You will see the current never reaches zero. Nevertheless, the peak, the peak cycle to cycle do, do not change like they, they did change before. So the converter works in a, in a very stable way. I think the current limit uh, for this device will be reached at about 400 milliamps. So I'm loading it quite a bit behavior is stable. 
Uh, I will increase the voltage. And you'll see there is no change in, in the behavior. It's all stable. Cycle to cycle, no variation in the peak current. That's what you want to see. And I highly encourage everyone looking at switching mode power supplies. Have a look at the, at the main waveforms, the device current, the switching nets. You want to make sure the duty cycle is stable. If you don't change the load, the duty cycle should not change. Uh, you will see this variation in frequency here. So it's measuring between 28 and 31 kilohertz, roughly. So this is the jitter of the Viper, and it's an intended function. It improves EMIA. Um, it's randomized. Slight change in, into the switching frequency of the device to improve EMI uh, by sp spreading the spectrum of uh, the emitted emissions. As far as switching, it's uh, it's very stable uh, throughout the input voltage range. So I lowered it below 70 volts, and I think I hit the current limit. Behavior stable even at low output current. And I'm just varying the input voltage. So for low output current, low power operation, you'll see the frequency. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but this is reading 15 kilohertz. This means the device is working in burst mode. So it's skipping one cycle in this case by effectively that's lowering the, the frequency to half of what it normally is just because the, the load does not require a higher switching frequency. As I'm increasing the output current, the device will move out of uh, burst mode and start switching at the uh, typical switching frequency of 30 kHz right now. So I increase it sli slightly. When it was unstable, you saw the frequency was lower as if the device was working in burst mode even when the output power was much higher. And it was going in and out of burst mode. Well, in this case, even if I increase the, the time scale, you'll see there's no change in the in the frequency or change the current peak. This light peak here is just a noise, it's a, it's an artifact of the switching. It exists every time when the the MOSFET is turned on. This is due to this uh, capacitive discharge uh, between the drain and source. So there you go. Uh, that's a stable operation. I'm changing input voltage between minimum and maximum. I'm changing output current between minimum and maximum. There is no cycle to cycle variation like we saw before. And the last test that I recommend you always do before you're 100% sure that the power supply is stable is run a step response. In this case, I set up the electronic load to change between uh, minimum and maximum output current. And uh, let me pause for a second here. This is changing every couple of seconds. So it's a slow type of test. You don't have to have electronic load to do it. You just make sure that you capture the event of when the load is changing and analyze the behavior during the change. Uh, I've also added the green trace here, which is looking at the AC component of the output voltage. So here is the event of change. The, the current at the output is changing between maximum and minimum. As a result, there is a slight jump of the output voltage, but it settles down nicely. 
Uh, same when the vault, the current changes between minimum and maximum. There's a slight dip down and it settles back to DC nicely. What I mean by nicely, there is no ringing. There is no large overshoot. It's a few couple hundred millivolts changing the voltage. And we saw that that's a result of the load regulation of the converter and not a result of the dynamics of the of the loop. Uh, if you saw some type of ringing at the output, that would suggest that the phase margin is insufficient or if the overshoot was too high, maybe the bandwidth wasn't uh, sufficient as well. So that's a nice way to analyze stability in addition to what we did before looking at the cycle-to-cycle uh, -cycle switching activity. And also make sure that you're looking at the full input voltage range as you're running the test. So I'm about 80 volts right now and I'm going to sweep it slowly, making sure that there isn't any specific input voltage level at which we see some ringing uh, or undesired behavior. So I think it's looking pretty good. I'm almost uh, 260 volts right now. The range is 260 to 85, 265 to 85 volts. And there isn't anything that concerns me really at this point. So. I think it works good. Um, we saw the switching cycle to cycle was stable. We see that the step response is good and the settling time is not too long and there isn't any huge overshoots. So everything is within specification and this is gonna work well uh, for this application. I think this is a good example. All right, that's everything that I wanted to show you. Here are the four points that I want to highlight as a takeaway from the video. Always use eDesign. I highly encourage you to use it. It's very easy way to, for you to create a schematic and it will be final most of the time. At least it will give you the best approximation for all the component values that are best for your specification and it will save you time to go and work through all the theoretical equations to calculate values for the various components. Always make sure that you verify once you have a prototype, verify the switching of the Viper. Always probe the voltage of the freewheeling diode. Always look at the inductive current this will help you avoid things like saturation in the inductor, poor switching activity, high output voltage ripple. Always look at the AC and the output voltage as well. It's a very good idea to test in you know, all input voltage uh, cases, not just minimum and maximum, but also uh, in the full range of the input voltage, depending on the application. And of course, for all the voltage corners tested full output power and um, minimum output power as well. You want to verify at every likely operating point that the switching mode power supply is working well. And finally, always perform a low step test. Always check the power up and power down sequence. Make sure that the startup of the Viper is not too long. There isn't any overshoot when you step the power from no load to maximum load. These are the tests that will certainly exaggerate and show you if there is a problem with the design. Uh, stability most of the time will show there. And uh, I highly encourage you that you, you try and leave no stone unturned when you verify your power supply. Okay, thanks a lot.